Very cool. I got Justin Leggett on the Capital Razor Show now brought to you by PitchDex.com and Richard Wilson and the Family Offices Club. Very cool to meet you, my friend. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm happy to be on the show with you. Rock and roll. All right, man. So you're partnering up with somebody I've previously had on the show, Devin Elder. How that are things right. going in your business right now? Oh, man, things are great. Super, super busy first part of 2022. We had a number of, uh, well, a big multifamily offering that we closed on. And then also some ranch investments that are a newer part of our business that, um, we, uh, that we've kind of rolled out over the last year that has been real interesting and a nice complement to the long-term nature of the multifamily syndications. Fascinating. Hey, uh, so I've interviewed some of Devin's previous partners and friends and students I'm talking about Ruben Dominguez. Oh, quite a few. <laughs> yeah, Abel Pacheco. Definitely. Okay, so tell me a little bit about your integration into DJE. Well, actually, even before we go there, how about you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into multifamily syndication? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to. So um, I got to DJE. Uh, Devin and I hooked up in early 2020, February of 2020. But before that, I spent the majority of my career in the investment management business, um, in marketing and relationship and business development roles uh, for about 15 years. Started off as a financial advisor, was licensed with my series seven, 66, 24, into the gills with all that stuff, and worked long enough within that, um, that structure of, or that sort of organization to really kind of become very disenfranchised by the public equities markets and just how things happen um, and, and, what, and what people end up with versus the kind of aspirational imagery that I was coming up with on a daily basis with my designers for marketing materials and things of that nature to generate business. Um, and it was at that point that um, I took a little bit of a break from business um, and uh, just did consulting with um, you know, financial services firms, creative firms. But it was, uh, like I said, in 2018 is really kind of whenever I jumped in, back into kind of the investment game. And it was with a, a private equity firm up in Austin. And I worked with them to help them um, gain SEC approval, uh, market, and then break escrow on a private market multifamily REIT that uh, focused on properties throughout the Sunbelt region. And it was a really interesting product, um, but I really kind of wanted to focus, like just have more focus. I was like running investor relations with them, marketing as well, and had designers reporting to me. And I, I started off as a marketing consultant and didn't really kind of see myself kind of being like having direct reports in this sort of situation. And um I wanted to have more focus and more focus on the type of activities um, that were high level activities that I thought were the kind of things that I could really only do myself. Um, and so that was about the time that me and Devin um, crossed paths. I was trying to get down to San Antonio to be closer to family. And um, it just really, really worked out. I think that there's a lot of alignment there um, from a stylistic standpoint. Not to say that we have the same styles. Um, we're, we're very different, I guess, from a stylistic standpoint on a personal and professional level. Uh, but it works, I think, um, as far as our roles and, and what we do here and how we uh, handle the investors and, and what we do for them. But yeah, since um, since I came on board with them, it has been a just a, a growth story. I started in February of 2020. Uh, literally, I think like a month later, shelter in place orders happened. And it was just a very, very strange time to kind of be in a role where you're meeting people for the first time, you know, meeting people for the first time. And it's um, through a Zoom. Um, and um, it really kind of caused us to look at a lot of different things or some other things uh, a different way. And then Shortly after I came on board, another big uh, kind of inflection point in our business was that um, uh, Eli Acevedo, who's the chief operations officer for DJE Properties, which is our in-house property management company, uh, we integrated that side of the business all under the same roof. And that was just, you know, I don't think we knew it at the time, or at least I didn't, but that was just a huge, huge um, inflection point, like I said, that I think really kind of gave us the impotence and the confidence to, to go after a lot of the deals that we've done over the last two years and the growth that we've experienced. Cool. I'll definitely be interested to talk about what you know about the timeline of DJE. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about marketing. So what kind of marketing did you do for your private equity firm, the previous one? Um, and how has it helped you with the marketing that you do with DJE? A big part of it, I, I think something that really kind of stemmed out of the licensing, strangely enough, a benefit, um, was I, I've always really been um, effective in marketing roles. And the large, you know, half of my 
my 15, 17 years in the investment management business was purely marketing rules, um, where I was basically right under the, you know, on reporting to the chief marketing officer. And I had event planners, graphic designers, everybody kind of coming at me. Um, and um, the kind of marketing that, that they were doing up to that point was just largely ineffective because it was an intellectual and a creative exercise. Um, and they hadn't had somebody um, in the business, you know, because the CMO is out glad handing and working events and conferences and things of that hand, that nature, but they didn't have somebody who came from the business side into the marketing department. Um, and at that point, I was really kind of not only in business development, but was also operationally working. I was very, very involved in the CRM system, which kind of goes into like a big part of what all investor relations people should be doing mm -hmm. is focusing on whatever technology you have available to make your life better, uh, like life easier. But we'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, but basically like my most effective part of my career from a marketing standpoint has been just focusing on solving problems and not focusing on making it pretty. Um, it, you know, making it pretty needs to happen and aesthetics are important, especially as it relates to user experience and design. Um, but first and foremost, you have to solve the problem. And very quickly in my career, I was able to connect the creative exercises with the practical aspects of solving problems. Um, and so our, our marketing seemed to get quite a bit more effective back then. And then that's really kind of what I applied to, you know, the REIT that I was working in. Um, but unfortunately, it's just, you know, as we moved past getting approval through with the SEC was something that I was working with them on. And then also starting to build out all the marketing processes engine and then moving towards breaking escrow with our first clients. Um, it's just, it kind of, once we started going through it and actually developing business, it kind of just seemed like the idealism behind the product, this idea of having a very, you know, extremely low cost um, or, or minimum investment amount and having access to a fund of private market multifamily um, assets it was very idealistic and it, and it looked so good, but like whenever we actually started developing business, it was just, we had the wrong audience. We were, um, and it was very, very hard to get the thing off of the ground um, just because, you know, at a $1,000 minimum investment um, and using strategies, marketing strategies, like AdWords strategies and things like that, that only kind of exponentially or exacerbate um, the wrong client type of situation. Um, it just made it very hard to kind of get up to a point to where we had some, some run rate and we were, you know, kind of sustaining things um, along with deal flow issues. So um, I, I like the aspect raising funds for a, a, um, a, a fund, sorry, raising funds for a fund or a REIT is quite a bit easier. Um, but that's also because you're dealing with um, investors who are making lower investment amounts. And so there's not as much risk associated, which mm. usually corresponds to the amount of due diligence that gets done. Um, once I came down here and I really started focusing on raising funds for standalone investments, 506B syndications primarily, um, it really kind of allowed me to connect my creative and and business uh, side of my brains that I'd kind of built on in the past, but really kind of connect it with a client base that had been built up and had a lot of just unearthed brand equity um, in it. And so since, you know, over the years since I've been here, I've really kind of just been focusing on what are continuing the type of marketing activities that will continue to solve those sort of business problems for people and will really kind of make us um, the type of firm that focus on practical things from a marketing standpoint, while at the same time, just making sure that things, I mean, because like, you know, whenever I got here, things like social media, for example, weren't paid as much attention to, to the point to where like we were kind of starting from scratch. So that was something that I really had to get up off the ground. Like for Instagram, for example, was one channel that we hadn't really done, you know, made a big break in. Um, and while I don't think that there's a huge pull or a huge amount of results that we get out of Instagram, it is a validation tool for people now. It, it, it allows you to make a cultural play. And the fact that we deal in physical assets, Instagram is a perfect, you know, platform for that. Like, you know, for showing the evolution and the transformation of our value add strategy. So um, doing those sort of things and kind of like trying to be mindful of like, how do we construct an overall like picture of what uh, kind of marketing needs to happen here to yield results. Uh, but at the same time, really just making sure that they're yielding results. And if they're not, then pivoting to something else that we think can.
Cool. Talk, talk to us a little bit about DJE. What has DJE been doing for the last five, 10 years? Where are they today? Yeah, so uh, DJE is uh, manned by the principal of Devin Elder. And um, like I said, I joined in February of 2020. Uh, we were a pretty small firm back then, but he actually got his start in the same way that a lot of multifamily syndicators get started, kind of in the single family game, fixing and flipping and things mm -hmm. like that. And I think that he was doing that prior to 2012, uh, at, you know, whenever he was a full-time employee and had a sales and marketing career in technology. Um, but in 2012, that's when he made the big jump and continued to really kind of do the, the fix and flip thing for a while until I think he was able, he got to a point where he just had to he had like a moment of clarity, whatever you want to call it. But, you know, he pulled off of the training that he received from a sales and marketing standpoint in his corporate background and, to, and was able to just basically identify that he wasn't going to scale the business to the extent that he thought was absolutely possible or that he thought was possible um, by being on, you know, so firmly entrenched on the active side of the investment dynamic. And that was really kind of what prompted him to start his evolution in education and multifamily investing and started with education and networking. And then, you know, went on to joining maybe some, you know, some smaller networking and investment groups support groups kind of thing. And then uh, moving on to doing your own smaller deals. And, you know, since 2012, we've acquired over 5,000 units and we currently have an, around 2,200 doors under management. Um, and that's a combination of, of our core portfolio and, and assets that we've raised funds for and, and taken over and are now operating. And then also a small number of uh, third party assets uh, like Abel Pacheco or, or Ruben Dominguez. Um, we act as the property manager or project manager on uh Local, usually local San Antonio based assets, uh, where we have a really strong relationship with uh, the um, the operator and also a very close proximity to the asset. Sweet. That's a amazing portfolio. Tell me a little bit about San Antonio multifamily. What's the market like there? I mean, it's definitely not as attention grabbing as DFW or Houston. And we absolutely love that about right. it. Um, it's a very much more and I feel like, let me take a step back. I feel like our style um, here at DJE um, is very reflective of kind of the under the radar and unassuming kind of style, mm, humble style that that um, that our city has and is known for. You know, it's a, you know, it's military town USA, um, and so huge, huge uh, population of military, medical. Uh, there's a small tech scene bumping popping up, and um, I mean. There's, and that tech scene is kind of happening like in the downtown area, which is where we're in the process of moving our headquarters. Uh, we actually um, closed recently on a historic building in downtown San Antonio that is going to be our new headquarters. And um, it's really going to kind of be, I think, like a symbol that kind of acknowledges the, the, the strength of our connection to the city and how it's you know, been a big part in allowing Devin and, and this organization to get to where we have been. But at the same time, kind of positioning ourselves to, to grow into the future, because I mean, you know, the property management company, DJE Properties, went from two employees, I think, in May of 2020 to it's now over 75 people. Um, and there's just a huge like there's a culture wow. being, being built here, um, you know, and, and while the investment side of things and the side that I play on is is not as it's not something that requires as much scaling, you know, because like it's we're raising funds and Devin's handling a lot of the acquisition activity and deal flow and things of that nature. Um, but there's just like really, really exciting things happening. And I think that, you know, it's a combination of us just coming under one roof and becoming one organization and kind of really seeing like the opportunities that are available because I mean, I, I have to believe that, um, you know, whenever you're a fundraiser, whenever you're an investor relations person, um, there is inevitably a part of your own personal brand that gets inextricably linked to the partners that you choose to, to work with and raise funds for. Um, and I don't think that I would be comfortable um, in a lot of settings um, unless we had the structure that we do have here that we have here um, being Devin's connection to not only the city, the fact that he was born and raised here um, and has been here his entire life, um, the clients that he that were built uh, prior to me getting here and that we've uh, acquired since then. And then also just our property management team. I mean, like it's 95% of the entire project is them, you know, working with the residents, refining the tenant, the tenant base, implementing the value add plan. Um, it, so it stands to reason that like, you know, they, they have to be completely on board. And for us, it works better if, if we're working with our own people who have skin in the game and, you know, 
basically getting information straight from straight from the source kind of thing, rather than a third party relationship where it's not a huge difference to them if they report correct information or incorrect information. I'm very fascinated by the scaling syndication company. I believe you said you had around 20 employees when you got there and now you're up to 75. Is that correct? It was far less than 20. <laughs> wow. We, we were a fairly small organization. And, and, the, the, and while you know, the corporate team is, is now probably closer to around 20, I would say like between our accounting teams, our teams, the ops side, and you know, HR, that kind of thing, you know, it's, it's definitely a hundred plus person company, I would say right now. Wow. And, um, and yeah, and that's just, it, it seems like it's been like five years. I think part of that is COVID, but like the other part is just like, so much has happened that it seems like it should have taken way longer. <laughs> Tell me about the, the growing of it. Like, how do you decide which team members or which employees you guys have selected to bring onto your team and where does all the money to pay them come from? I mean, I can't really get into the books because I'm not a CPA, but I do know that, um, you know, hiring is a big, huge focus for DG, for the property side of the business. And I mean, you know, it, just like any other sort of hiring decision, it, it, it is an incredibly, it can be an incredibly positive or, or bad thing if you either hire the right person or hire the wrong person. So uh, one thing that I think that has been incredibly beneficial is that um, Eli's team has really kind of been in some form or fashion uh, connected to, or, you know, like been part of his network for a long time. So, um, he, he had a really, really strong network of just leasing consultants and things like that in, in the area, uh, because they had been working, um, in San Antonio property management previously. And then from there, you know, it's just kind of been, I, I kind of feel like a butterfly effect. Um, because a lot of times we, we, hand select, I think people who just have like a willful determination to kind of level up their life. They want to change things. And um, so we're, we're not really kind of focused so much on, you know, finding people that have this sort of sterling multifamily pedigree. We're I did, like trying to find people that are hungry and that have skills and that want to work hard and then give them the training and the, the program that, that Eli and his team has been working on and, and perfecting since even before DJE and um, give that to them and just make them trust in the process that, that if they do these things, it could be a career changing moment for them. Do you guys spend any time focusing on like the vision and the values of the company and integrating that amongst the entire organization? Absolutely. So how does that work? What does that look like? It's everything from subconscious and little things that I do as far as like dropping in um, our, our literal verbatim values interspersed between, you know, in communications throughout the company or with our investors. There's a lot of very kind of like subconscious things that I drop in things in communications, newsletters, things to investors where I'm consciously using values language that connects to our website um, to reinforce kind of stylistic and attitudinal approaches to how we handle communication and also just, you know, escalated situations with the project. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like there, there's definitely like kind of a, like, I mean, for example, like one big thing I, I use a lot is one of our values is everyone involved wins. And that is one that like, we really kind of like buckle down on. And I, I drop a lot just, you know, conversationally and also in email, but all the way, th then all the way to, you know, the opposite side of the fence where it's like, you know, Eli, Devin and I are, you know, I'm sitting, I'm sitting down with them and I'm walking through them almost through like a mini focus group to really kind of identify, like, if these sort of things are still consistent, how do they show up in our business now versus, you know, two years ago versus 12 years ago kind of thing. And so um, there's definitely, um, with such a huge, huge push being behind trying to capture, document, and grow this culture that is that is that is started here at this company, um, there is definitely a um, a conversation and a narrative and, and an attempt to try and be deliberate about making sure that we're being mindful of of like how that showed up in our business in the past and what that value meant then and like how does it show up now and how does it show up? I mean, what does it mean now? How does it show up now? And, but I don't think that there's any sort of fundamental change as far as our direction that, that, that trumps any or changes any of those things. It's just basically of like, how have we changed and how have those values 
change in a way that they show up practically on an so everyday basis. As far as DJE is concerned, what do you guys want to do over the next five years? What are you guys looking to scale into? Are you guys wanting to acquire a specific number of units or just continue to do things at your current rate? Tell me more about what you guys have in mind for the vision of the future for DJE. I mean, the vision for DJE uh, beyond 2022 and 2023 really kind of resides with Devin and, and he, you know, releases, lets those things out to the world as they need to be for right now. We're focusing on continuing to do more multifamily. We want to do another 400 units before the end of the year. That's the goal. And that's what we're marching towards. And then 2023 is probably going to be even more of that. Um, more, continuing to focus on on uh, a ran the ranch business, which um, are you know some short term high yield products that uh, income products that we rolled out last year that had a really really big appetite with our investor base. Mm. Um, so more of that likely. And then you know just kind of keeping our eyes open. Um, you know I kind of mentioned um, that we kind of. Roll, you know, at the beginning of COVID, kind of rolled off workforce so much and kind of wanted to take risk off of the table in the form of like bloated CapEx and renovation budgets and really going to focus more on the on cleaner assets where there's an operational and management play there. Um, but with that being said, um, you know, I think that, you know, we, we, we looked at and, and almost acquired a, a class A property. That being said, it was still a value added play, but it was class A. And then there was the ranch stuff that we did this past year, and that's kind of become a viable product and, and um, vertical for us. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's just an open, uh, you know, kind of an open minded mentality towards where's value in, in the real estate game and how can we squeeze the value out of it? Yeah, all syndicators need to be able to adapt, pivot and evolve. And any real estate investor in general, keep that in mind. If you keep doing the same thing over and over as your competition is changing, you may end up a little bit behind. All right, let's jump into the lightning round. First question, what's the best vacation you've ever taken? Uh, Ireland. What, one of the five times I went to Ireland. It could be either my first time for St. Paddy's Day in Belfast or the last time whenever I watched my son take his first steps on Christmas morning in Dublin. I've heard Ireland a lot on the, as an answer to that question. What's magical your favorite? Place. Go ahead. It's a magical place. Uh, the people are the best part of it though. What's your favorite childhood memory? Uh, favorite childhood memory would, man, that's a tough one. Um, favorite childhood memory would probably be, it, it's probably like a concert. Um, and up, I'm just going to go with my first concert, which was Guns N' Roses, Metallica, and Faith. <laughs> that sounds like it Houston Astrium. <laughs> That's <laughs> a good first concert. Very yeah, cool. Yeah. I'm favorite... still ringing. <laughs> <laughs> favorite book of any kind. Favorite book is um, uh, da, 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 da. right now it is Confederacy of Dunces. Fascinating. What's the best? This is a short answer on this question. What's the best way to raise capital from your perspective? Consideration, consider and know your audience, communication, Just know how to communicate with that audience. And um, consideration, communication. Yeah, I would say that those are really kind of the big ones. Consideration, communication, responsiveness. Cool. Don't hide, don't ever hide. Mm -hmm. um, and don't put lipsticks on pigs. Like don't color things with rose colored glasses, give people the truth, be authentic and don't hide. All right. How long do you want to live? As long as I'm, as I'm supposed to. <laughs> you got to You got to put a number on it. I'm going to go with uh, 88. Very cool. Do your spiritual philosophies have anything to do with your success in business? Yes and no, because I don't consider what I consider spiritual philosophies, I'm not sure if are considered generally spiritual philosophies. Fair enough. Do you, how about this? What do you love best about being an artist as a painter? That it's, I hate puzzles, like literally, like, like looking at a puzzle box, I'm just like, no, I'm out of here. But that's like, painting is just a puzzle to me. I just, and I, at some point I've seen in my head or I've dreamed all the pieces and I just have to bring it to fruition. And 
the, the not knowing if I can do it or remember it is, is really exhilarating. What do you love best about ranch syndications? Fast, man. Run, it, move, it come ups fast. We strike fast. It's like a war party almost kind of thing. Um, I like that it's, it's fast and that every, it's like all hands on deck and we're just trying to get closed on this thing. Have you ever experienced a miracle or had a near death experience? Absolutely. Tell me. Uh, near death um, at a, uh, it was just kind of being in the wrong place, wrong time. And it kind of gave me a big eye opening experience about um, the universe and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, definitely an, uh, an eye opening experience. And it kind of, I think, made me have a more healthy relationship and more mature relationship, not only with my son, but also just the universe and the world. What kind of impact would you like to leave in the world? Hmm. I want my impact to be most um, obviously noticed or, or seen or felt uh, just in the difference I make in my, son, my son's life. I love that. Very cool answers on the lightning round. Shout out to the Capital Razor Nation. Thanks for tuning in. Please leave us a five-star written review. Shout out to Legacy Acquisitions, my fund management company, and our sponsors, Good Egg Investment Syndication, Pro Kate and Patel, Jerome Myers, and PitchDex.com with Richard Wilson and the Family Office Club. If you're looking for a Capital Razor coach, I invite you to check out my coaches at the realestateaccelerator.com to get $1,000 off their program. Just mention our show. All right, man. Justin, how does the audience get a hold of you? Justin at djetexas.com or go to djetexas.com and look at the bottom right-hand corner. There's a little uh, box for a 15-minute consultation. There you go. And then do you have any last words of wisdom for the aspiring capital raiser, marketer, or syndicator as they scale their business? No matter how big or small, there's going to come a point, and it's usually about a month to maybe three weeks before close where you're going to be in the red and it's going to look bleak. Just keep grinding, keep your head down, keep pushing and be communicative and be honest. But at the same time, just have faith in yourself that it will happen. Love it. Cool, man. T covered a bunch of really fascinating topics, the private equity firm, you know, the, the direction of your company and the scaling that's going on there is all very fascinating. We have around eight people on my team and we're looking to grow that. I'm not sure exactly how big, but I'm very curious about people that have scaled in their business, what it's looked like and always looking for some pointers there. So thanks for that. Absolutely. With that, we're going to let you go, man. This has been a blast. Thank you for coming on the show, Justin. Thank you all. Thanks for having me.